This episode of Scheming is sponsored by De Simone. De Simone Consulting Engineering provides structural engineering, facade design consulting, integrated design and detailing, and construction consulting services for buildings of all types. Known for delivering thoughtful, innovative, and sustainable solutions, De Simone provides dedicated services from its UK, US, Canada, South America, and Middle East offices. To find out more, visit www.d-simone.com. Hello and welcome to Scheming, the Place North podcast that gives property folk a platform to talk about three schemes they think about a lot. I'm your host, Dan Whelan, Deputy Editor of Place Northwest. Today's guest founded his development company in 2006 at the age of 23 and since then has gone on to deliver schemes of all types across the Northwest, from heritage office projects in Liverpool to new build, build to rent schemes in Manchester. Today's guest is also no stranger to a podcast studio, having started the No Bullshit Property Podcast in 2022. Joining me today to talk about the three schemes that he thinks about the most is Howard Lord, founder of Cert Property. Howard, welcome to the pod. Thank you, pleasure to be here. So 23, that's very young to start out in, in property. How did that happen? And, and was it always the plan to get to where you are now? Oh, there's never been a plan. <laughs> and that's why it happened. Uh, I'll, I'll try and give you the short version. Uh, but basically, uh, I, I graduated university, went out on the usual path to go and get a, a graduate job uh, and got a job offer with a, a shipping company um, to go and work in Mombasa in Kenya, in Africa. Okay, very interesting. Uh, yeah, the adventurous spirit in me wanted to, uh, to get away from these uh, rainy isles. And uh, yeah, so I was ready to go with my, my bags packed up until probably about two weeks before I was supposed to go there. Uh, I, I got a phone call from the, the company saying, uh, we've just been bought out by someone else. They've got their own graduate program and they've told us not to accept any graduates onto our program. So I was like, right, well, what do I do? Mm. I'm supposed to be out there in a couple of weeks, literally bags packed. Um, and the next graduate intake is in for another 12 months. And this was 2005. Property market was was booming back then. Uh, you know, banks were, were lending 125% mortgages, all of that sort of thing. The good old days. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I thought, well, I'll give that a go meanwhile, whilst I'm looking for a, a proper job. No one can see my inverted commas uh, on podcast. Um, so, yeah, that's what I did. I thought I'll give it a go, get, get involved in the property industry. Wow, a real sliding doors moment. But absolutely. Where do you think you'd be now if you'd, if you'd gone to Mombasa? Um, hopefully still alive. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, I, I mean, gosh, it would have been a very different life path. Um, yeah, the adventurous spirit in me just wanted to go somewhere, see somewhere new, do something completely different. So would not even begin to imagine where, mm. uh, where I might be. Maybe delivering um, developments in uh, in Mombasa and, and Nairobi. Maybe. Very possible. Yeah. So you were, you were 23 in 2006 when you started to, which means you were 25 in 2008 when the financial crash happened. How did you deal with that, your young mind? Because I remember what I was like at 25 and I don't think I would have been able to sort of handle such a seismic event, especially when you're just starting out. How was that? Uh, at the time, horrific. Uh, it was difficult enough to try and make sense of an industry uh, that had no, it, you know, no experience of and mm. no real guidance and, and tutorship in and that I was kind of making up as I went along. And then to see the rules of the game shift so dramatically, yeah, it was it was difficult at the time to, to try, try and get a grasp of that. But, um, you know, I, th I think looking back, though, it's the best education I could possibly had. To learn all of that at that age, you know, to see businesses um, struggling and raveling business models, having to change things, like I say, the rules of the game changing overnight, lending uh, disappearing and... Mm -hmm seeing the creativity of some of the people in the industry to survive and uh, then go on to thrive off the off the back of that was like i say a really good education mm. so yeah i guess it was a case of just like i say looking around and seeing what, what others were doing to um to try and evolve at, at yeah. that difficult time we, we hear a lot at the moment about sort of how difficult the the market is and the sort of the lending landscape is tough and um, people struggling to get on site. Does does having gone through two thousand eight, 
does that provide a bit of valuable perspective or, or is it is it as bad now as it as it was then surely surely not <laughs> surely not um i think it gives a very useful uh, perspective i mean it's a very different situation that we're in and that we've been in over the last couple of years um but yeah having been through a similar sort of context where you're having to almost start again with with business plans for delivery of, of projects um it's definitely useful for the, the the current version of me for the previous version of me to have gone through that at such a, a young age and perhaps not been as as flapped as I could have been with um with certain things happening and certain challenges that you face and I think probably did teach me a lot about lateral thought and problem solving and that they're just there isn't just one way of uh, approaching things and, and and one way of delivering things so. absolutely um let's talk a, a little bit about your podcast so the uh, No Bullshit Property Podcast. Mm. Um, it's very good. I listen to it regularly. Uh, you've had some fantastic guests on and you um, you present that with a, with a colleague of yours, Paul. Um, I'm intrigued by the name. Mm. So the No Bullshit Property Podcast suggests that there is some bullshit in the, in the property industry. Um, what's your biggest gripe with the industry that you work in? Um, the bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Give me some examples. I, I think as an industry, uh, we are quite rigid. Um, and, and again, going back to what we just said, I think the events of the last few years have seen a lot of shifts uh, a lot quicker. And I guess that's the, the symptom of going through a, a period of market um, tumult. Mm. Um but yeah, as an industry, we're, we're quite rigid in how we look at things. You know, things have been done a certain way for a very long time. So there's a, a real ingrained culture of, well, we do it this way. So so why would what, would that change? And, you know, that goes from how we build things. I think that's probably one of my, my biggest gripes is just that, that mindset of, well, it's always been built that way. Mm. Um, and I know it's difficult because we've got, you know, the rules of, of building control and, and, and planning and beyond that also the mortgage market as well uh, that we have to conform with um, when we're, you know, trying to push the boundaries on, on things of how we, we deliver them and the materials and the, um, you know, the, the format that they're mm. delivered in. So I get that the, there are these constraints and some of them are there for very good reasons, you know, fire regs, et cetera. Um, but I think you look at the UK compared to some other European markets, and we are a lot less innovative in our approach to how we go about building projects. Okay. So I think that's one of my biggest gripes in terms of, yeah, the, the lack of uh, innovation and the lack of willingness to look at different ways of approaching things. But that, that has changed a lot over the last few years, mostly because we've been pushed into it uh, mm. by those, those same regulations as well. Yeah, so a silver lining of the upheaval of recent years is, is that, yeah, it's bringing people to a different place and making them, making them do things differently. Yeah. Um, I've, just, I've just had a look at your podcast on, on Spotify and under more podcasts like this, uh, Place Northwest podcast is there, so that's nice. So listen to Howard's, listen to ours, or vice versa, <laughs> whatever you like. So now, Howard, as you know, uh, on today's podcast, I'm going to ask you about three schemes. Uh, the one you're most proud of, the one you wish you had done, and the dream scheme. So let the scheming begin. Howard, what's the scheme that you're most proud of? Uh, I think it's a standard answer, isn't it? We're proud of every scheme uh, mm -hmm. for, for different reasons. Um, I'm yet to have someone on the podcast who, who has said, I'm not proud of XYZ <laughs> scheme. So yes, you've tipped that, Bob. Uh, but a scheme that particularly proud of is Duke and Parr, our uh, office refurb in, in Liverpool. Um, number of reasons why. Uh, a, the, uh, the challenge of delivering it through the pandemic. So, you know, we signed our bill contract, I think it was uh, April or May 2020. So this is a spec office refurb mm -hmm. of a, a grade two listed heritage building in, in Roeports in Liverpool. Yeah, the former Bibby Line head office, isn't it? That's the one, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so going back to shipping. Yeah. You were going to go and get into shipping. Yeah, we can. Yeah. There's yeah. the connection. There's the connection. Um, and yeah, signing a bill contract on a completely spec office uh, at that moment in time did seem 
questionable. Uh, and, you know, we'd had a funding package which had fallen away as well. Um, so at the moment in time of, of signing that bill contract, we still needed to sort out our funding mm. on that scheme. So we, we, we took a chance. Sounds like a huge chance. Yeah. You know, at that time, yeah. no one, everyone was working from home. Yeah. No one knew what the office was going to be. Indeed. Why did you decide to go for it rather than, you know, just just hang fire and, and wait for, you know, a bit more certainty. Uh, we believed that the scheme was going to be epic. It was going to be, you know, one of the best schemes that Liverpool had seen as a, as a, as a new office space. Um, also took the, the calculated risk that the pandemic would mean a lot of other people would be putting pause on, on delivery. Yeah. Um, and we knew that there, you know, notwithstanding the fact that everyone was working from home, there was a um, a supply demand imbalance uh, in in Liverpool in yeah. the office market and still is uh, and still is yeah absolutely uh, and you know we knew from our experiences in Liverpool as well there's a lot of exciting companies high growth companies there in the the gaming software sector so we felt confident enough that you know we had these these pieces largely aligned and it was then just taking a bit of a gamble on what was going to come out the other side of COVID. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think in terms of the, the original question, proud of us for doing the the research to take that calculated risk, proud of the, the outcomes of it as well. Um, I mean, uh, Liverpool uh, gets mixed press in terms of the, uh, the, the planning department there, um, certainly over the last few years. Um, but you know, our experience working with the planners was was great. Um, very collaborative with the the, the heritage team yeah. at Liverpool. Uh, the the professional team were uh, great to work with. Um, the the project just you know went smoothly. Was um, you know the the outcome in terms of the finished product as well was was fantastic. Mm. And you know, testament to that is the the letting that we we ultimately got for the project. Yeah, so to Sony, well, Fire Sprite, which is owned yes. by, by Sony, video game developer, signed a 12-year lease on the whole building. Mm. So at that moment, once you've got the, the signature on the, on the paper, that must have been, you know, a complete feeling of vindication for the decision you look, you took a couple of years previous. Absolutely, yeah. And, uh, you know, partway through the delivery of it, you know, we were having people coming looking around and all of them were looking around going, wow, this is incredible space. So we already kind of knew that the decision we'd taken was the, was the right one, that, you know, there wasn't this, this space being delivered into mm. the Liverpool market. But yeah, as you say, getting the, getting that signature on the paper is, uh, was, was, was validation. I think, um, a big lesson though, uh, whilst it's a scheme where, um, very proud of, and like I say, probably most proud of, um, and it, you know, turned out great in terms of the product. It turned out great in terms of the, the letting we got. Um, all of that for, can count for nothing if your timing isn't right. And, uh, you know, during the, the period we went through, we, we delivered it through COVID, we come out the other side, um, you know, the world returns to semblance of, of normality. And then we have the, the mini budget and then all of the, uh, the interest rate uh, increases, which then um, severely impacted the, the values in the office market. Mm -hmm. So um, we got everything right, but still... Um, Some things you can't sort of legislate for. Exactly, mm. exactly. Uh, but still very proud of the, the outcome with the project. Yeah, and, and you, you looked to, you know, having done all of this work and secured the, the strong covenant with the Sony-owned, business you looked then to sell it what what's what's the latest on on that do you still own it or have you managed to to sell it yeah we still own it and okay. uh it it goes back to the the point i just said mm -hmm. you know uh, you can do everything right and then timing can uh, can catch you out i mean think for for us for the hard work that had gone in um the uh the results of selling it wouldn't have, have quite matched that um you know we we're also in a period where it was tricky to to get bank finance so we had to look at our options in terms of refinancing okay we've secured a refinance now uh which gives us the ability to kind of sit back and wait and see what happens with the office market before uh, making any further decisions on it. Get your crystal ball out. What What, what is the future of, of the office market? Because it's sometimes easy in our property bubble to to think, you know, the, the stuff you hear from agents, et cetera, is that, you know, the office market is coming back. There'll always be a place for the office. But the reality is, you know, Manchester and other cities are much quieter than they used to be because a lot more people are working from home. They'll come to the office the odd day of the week, 
but companies need less space now than, than they did previously. So where do we where do we go from here? Um, I can only express my my, my personal opinion and views on this, but uh, th there's always going to be a, a place for the office to to organise. Uh, a team of people to work collaboratively on whatever that company's uh, output is. Mm. Um, there's always going to be a need for a central space for those people to come together. That probably doesn't look like the office of the pre-pandemic, and we've already seen how offices have, have changed in terms of expectations of um, employees, of what that office and that company mm. is going to provide to them. So I think there's always going to be a need for a central space for businesses. Now, that in a lot of instances, is already shaping up to not be as large as it was. Um, but there's not a one size fits all, and, mm. and, and never was. There was there was companies that were you know largely remote before the pandemic, um, and there's ones that have tried to maintain that continuity as much as they could through the pandemic of, of keeping people uh, working together. So I think it just means there's going to have to be a lot more flexibility in the office market, and also uh, a lot of different perspectives on. On what an office actually is yeah for sure and you're right when you say it's not a one-size-fits-all approach so i said there that companies are taking less space but if you look at the the bank of new york mellon uh they took an entire 200,000 square foot building recently you compare that to a law firm uh slater and gordon who downsized significantly so it's it's horses for courses isn't it, it depends what what you're after i suppose it is and i think you know link it back to the, the scheme we just talked about, uh, when we had one of those initial viewings with uh, with Firesprite, you know, we, we didn't know at the time that they were being bought by Sony. Mm. Um, and it was only a bit later on that, that that came to light. And it always seemed a bit odd to us why they were looking around this this building. Uh, it was 50,000 square foot. Um, and you were thinking something. Yeah, one <laughs> <not fair. laughs> Desk per square uh, meter ratio seems a bit off. Um, <laughs> And you know, one of one of the senior people later on said to me, "Well, you know, this is a, a space that's going to make people want to be part of this. Um, you know, we're going to go out and buy a number of other businesses, and to you know bring them together, we need a, a space that's going to inspire people. So, you know, from that point of view, yeah, you, you can understand why a company would want a lot of space if you're trying to integrate a lot of disparate either businesses or uh, departments within your business that all need to work together. It makes sense. But if you're an established business who, you know, are looking just to, you know, give a, a good work-life balance to your your team, or they can work more remotely, then they would have a very different approach. Mm -hmm. So yeah, mm -hmm. very, definitely horses for courses. Yeah, absolutely brilliant. So Duke and Par, mm -hmm. we've written about it extensively on Place Northwest. So for anyone who wants any more information, you can have a look on there. Um, right, let's move on to the second scheme that we're going to talk about today. So the one you wish you had done. Tell me about that. So if people have interpreted this differently, it could be one that you were involved in that never came to pass or one that you've seen and you've got a bit of bit of envy that you weren't involved in it. Mm. Tell me about your, your one you wish you'd done. Yeah, sure. So I've interpreted it as looking out there at what something someone else has done okay. that I, I find is a, a really interesting scheme. Um, and the one I've identified is uh, Kellum Central, which is part of the Kellum Island redevelopment in Sheffield. Uh, it was delivered by Situ, uh, developer based over in uh, in Leeds, and uh, I think it's just a, a, a really amazing example of urban regeneration. Um, you know, it goes back to my point of what I was saying before. A lot of uh, people in the industry are, are, are guilty of just looking at something in it being done the same way. Yeah. And if uh, that scheme had been looked at uh, in that way, we probably would have had some pretty bland uh, apartment blocks and some pretty familiar looking uh, housing typologies. But the the approach taken was was very different. It was thinking about how to create a modern community. You know, one of the big themes of that that scheme is getting cars out the way. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the, the scheme is, is pedestrianized. Um, you know, it was an early example of thinking of the importance of the the place in terms of the, the commercial uses going into the, the site as well, um, which obviously I think, you know, a lot more people now recognize the importance of. Um, again, kind of pushing the boundaries in terms of materiality, uh, typologies of, of units, but really well thought out, yeah. thought out from a, a community-centric point of view. 
goes back to your point earlier about being innovative, doesn't it? Yeah. You know, if anyone wants to have a look, just Google Kelham Central and you can see the, the difference in typologies that, that I was talking about and the materiality. And it, it just looks fresh. Yeah. It doesn't look like a, a cookie cutter approach. Exactly. Why aren't we doing more of that? Um, I think some of it is down to, you know, the, the safety and security you, you get in doing things the way that they've always been done. Yeah. Property is such a, a long-term payback beast. You know, the scheme that you're looking at designing, you're probably not building for another two years, maybe three years, uh, <laughs> based on current timescales uh, of how long things take. Um, so you're designing something already for the future mm. in terms of even building it, never mind people living in it. So you might be designing something that's five years away from people living in it. So making bets on that, making bets on doing things differently can feel very high risk. Yeah, yeah. Um, because as we've all experienced over the last few years, it's very difficult to know what's going to happen a year in advance, never mind five years. Yeah. So I think there's a, a kind of safety aspect of it that, you know, and again, big sums involved in property, not only is it a long-term payback, but there's very big sums involved in designing a scheme, buying the land, um, and big risks. And so I think that's also a challenge. And, you know, it is difficult to kind of look at something completely new and go, I'll take that chance. Yeah, absolutely. Is there a, a, like a policy lever that can be pulled or some sort of legislation introduced that would kind of free developers up to explore more creative avenues, do you think? Um, I, I think there's there's a few tiers to that. So I, I bang the drum quite a lot about um, being an SME developer because because we are, mm -hmm. um, and and the challenges that come with that. You know, as I said, property is a, a long term payback game, yeah. capital intensive, so it's very difficult to to be a, an SME developer when those are you know a couple of the the, the key uh, elements of the industry. Um, so add on to that. Like I say, the, the pressures then of trying to do something different, uh, it does become very challenging. What, what can change that? Uh, well, I think something that's flown a little bit under the radar so far in the budget announcement is the government's announcement of, I think it was 3 billion or 3.1 billion of, of funding support for SME developers. Yes. Um, and I think if, if that, the, the, the detail still hasn't, you know, mm -hmm. come through. It's literally just a figure it, at the moment. Yes. Exactly. There's no details around who's going to get that, how it's going to be distributed. No, I think, no. The, the, there's some bits of speculation about how it might work, but no, there's no, no firm detail. Mm -hmm. If that is administered and uh, provided to SME developers in the right way, then that is very clearly a way to, to help ease that pain of trying to do something different. If you're you know, I'm not saying that it's going to especially reward people for doing things differently, but if it does, then of course you're going to be more willing to to push things in a different direction. So, I think that's that's what one level of it. I think then the other level is there's there are the you know the bigger uh, players in the game who, you know, perhaps should be pushed as well to yeah. try and do things differently. Um, and I know some of the bigger house builders have, uh, I think it's I think it's Barrett's, um, hopefully as then I've named them, uh, who are running uh, something at the uh, the Salford uh, University. Yeah. Um, the Energy House Studio. Oh, yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there is that, those tentative steps, yeah. but those guys are far better off, um, far more able and capable to try and force innovation mm. but again they've got probably the least incentive because they've got a business model that works for them and uh, they're about uh, delivering returns to shareholders so maybe they do need a few nudges along the way to to help that along a couple of questions on that do you th so we often you know nimbyism is, is a real thing and people don't like homes being built near their home if they think it's going to add additional traffic or, or things like that do you think a more aesthetically appealing or different looking scheme such as Kellum Central could help solve some of those issues? Do you think people would be more likely to be accepting of a scheme if it was something a little bit different rather than just houses on a field? Yeah, I, I think the, the starting point is it's always going to be challenging to um, take people on a journey if they feel like they're going to have more traffic on the road, mm. that um, their view over the, the green fields is, is going to be removed. That's always going to be a challenge, of, of course. And, you know, just inherently people are quite resistant to, mm. to change. Um, but yes, that can, of course, that, that can be addressed by by design and, um, and making the place feel like something that 
they would want to be a part of as well. So, um, yeah, you know, definitely um, the, the scope for, for betterment and design of uh, some of the suburban uh, housing schemes that we see come forward. So if you look at Kellam Central, is there anything that you've taken or would like to take that's been done there and put into one of your schemes that you're working on on now? Yeah, I think it goes back to, like I say, it was very much a community focused project. You know, they've thought about how is this going to work best for the residents as one of their core principles. Uh, and that's a core principle that, you know, we very much are, are, are putting a lot of stock in. It's one of our core principles when looking at a scheme is making sure that that element uh, is, is well considered. Mm -hmm. So whether it is exactly the same uh, things that have been implemented there, maybe, maybe not, but just that core principle of taking it from a community first perspective. Is this going to be a place that works well for the residents of this community? Yes, yeah, so that's something that we've taken away from that and thought they've got that right. Okay. And just quickly, you mentioned the three billion announced in the budget for SME house builders, mm. but obviously a lack of detail around that. How best sh would that money be used? Do you think what what do you do you want to see it put into a big viability pot and and distributed you know to unlock brownfield schemes or how how best might that three billion be because you must have had had a think about that. Um, so there's a, there's a few ways I haven't really had a think about the best. I've had, I've tried to sort of second guess what might be the okay. way and um, I think there's. The, the way that uh, currently Homes England uh, work with RPs and RPs can submit for grant funding, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, I think it's called con continual market engagement. You've got a scheme, you bring it forwards, you can submit it for grant funding. Um, and if it ticks certain criteria, uh, it's it's awarded to you. I think that's a model that could obviously work quite well. Um, well instead of RPs, SMEs. SMEs, okay. yeah. Obviously, there's a set of infrastructure there to, to manage that process in terms of Homes England. So... Mm -hmm. In terms of it being implementable, um, it's not having to learn a whole new okay. system and implement a whole new system. So, I think that for me makes sense as probably the the, the easiest way to to make it effective. Okay. Uh, does that make it the best one? I'm not sure. There's probably uh, a few different ways, but that for me was made sense as a, a way to to kind of set it up. Yeah, absolutely. Use it. Use a mechanism that's already there. Exactly. Yeah. Brilliant. Fantastic. So, Kellum Central. Um, check it out. Very interesting, almost Amsterdam-like yeah. uh, in in some ways. Amsterdam has, has come up as an example of good practice uh, at various points on, on this series as well. So people are certainly looking uh, to the Netherlands for inspiration. Right, the final scheme we're going to talk about today is the dream scheme. So you can let your imagination run wild here. Uh, what is the one scheme that you would love to do that has not yet been done? So I'm not going to pit it down to a specific scheme it's more of a concept and um, this was inspired by an initiative that I saw launched uh, during COVID uh, over in the US um, and it was a, a collective who had come up with the idea of trying to make some of America's kind of rust belt towns uh, what they were calling creator towns so making them desirable places for uh, the, the digital nomad to want to, to settle, maybe for a short period of time, maybe mm -hmm. for a longer period of time, and uh, and work. Um, and at the time, there was also a few bits and pieces in the press that often is about uh, these these um, villages in like southern Italy and southern Europe where you can buy houses for a pound. Yeah, and I thought, wouldn't it be cool to in an attempt to repopulate these these places? Exactly. Yeah, and I thought, wouldn't it be cool to try and take what those guys are trying to do in the US? Um, and apply it to you know one of those villages where you're you're repopulating a town with digital nomads. Um, you know, obviously there's going to need to be support facilities there. Um, so you're bringing jobs for the local communities that are otherwise struggling and seeing depopulation in the first place because people are moving to the uh, the cities in in the north. Um, and I thought it was a really interesting concept, and, and sadly they didn't get much uh, much traction for it over over in the US. I think it was quite a, a difficult ask to make some of the, the Rust Belt uh, towns there uh, yeah, desirable places for, for digital nomads. Um, but it's always something that's sat in the back of my mind going, well, if there was an opportunity to do something like that, um, that would be a, a really cool engagement yeah. project. Yeah. How, do, how would you see that playing out over here? So you're targeting sort of... Well, there's always a, that argument, isn't there, about seaside towns, you know, mm. the faded kind of um, 
glory of the of the seventies, you know, or, or even earlier, the introduction of cheap flights, and it's kind of left them in a in a in a particularly bad way. Is is that somewhere where you see just taking towns particularly hard hit, and yeah. uh, what would you do if you, if you went in there and and try and tried to sort of uh, action this initiative we're talking about? Yeah, I think it's got to be joined up thinking in in quite a lot of ways, mm. uh, both in terms of getting a grasp of what, what that town offers. You know, you're going to have to offer something to make it attractive for the the footloose, um, you know, employees, uh, the digital nomads to, to want to live there. So it's obviously got to have some sort of lifestyle aspect. So you say the seaside town can can offer that. Okay, it's not the necessarily the warmest of waters to go uh, uh, surfing in, but, you know, you can add a lot of outdoor activities um, into into the mix, which I think is important. But also what the, the town offers, um, you know, in terms of shops, restaurants, mm. all of that sort of thing, that's that's an area that I think you've got to have those those foundations right. And it goes back to the, the placemaking point we said about uh, about Kellen. So, mm. um, and and then yeah, creating a housing product that that people would want to live in, uh, but also still having the transport connectivity as well, um, because even though you might be you know wanting to escape the city and live in a, a nice uh, seaside town. You still got to want to go back to the city and make it easy to do so. So yeah. I think those are probably the the key ingredients to to get right to deliver it. Yeah. Well, there's plenty of towns across the the north and and across the country that are you know looking for a new identity, mm. um, and and looking for you know something to anchor their regeneration to. So maybe this is because we hear a lot about sort of residential led regeneration. So town centres, Bolton springs to mind building high density schemes in the town centre in, in order to get that critical mass of people in the hopes that, you know, it will revive the town, you know, now that retail is is much different. But beyond getting people in, that it seems to be right, we'll get people in and then the rest will sort of take care of its of itself. This mm. thing that you're talking about is kind of a bit more um for want of a best phrase, prescriptive. You're kind of saying this is what we're going to do and we're going to target this particular section of people. Um, and, and go down, go down that way. It's a bit more targeted, isn't it, than, than the approach we're seeing? Yeah, and I think it's it, it, it's difficult to, to have a, a prescriptive formula. But um, a, a lot of these these seaside towns, you know, it's difficult to create a new identity that's based on a specific sector mm -hmm. um, because you know there's already a lot of industrial clusters that are already established. Not saying it's impossible, but it makes it a bit more difficult. So what what else can you underpin a community on well actually if it, if you're not trying to pin it to an industry and you're pinning it on a on a dem demographic mm. you can attract um it's about putting the like i say the pieces in place to attract that demographic so i think there's got to be the lifestyle offer which you know like i say might be the, the the access to nature on your doorstep or the seaside on your doorstep but it's also got to have some sort of offer um in terms of amenities and facilities and you know a bakery and all of that but also you know the important stuff like you know doctors, dentists, and all of that as well. So it's getting those key ingredients right, mm. um, positioning and marketing the town right as well is is going to be very important to to try and make something like that possible. Yeah, branding really important. Yeah. Do you have somewhere in mind that you think ticks those boxes that you just mentioned, but is also in need of some kind of rejuvenation? Is is there anywhere that you can think of specifically that would that would tick those boxes? Are you asking me this because I went to visit Morka? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Howard is on our uh, recent investment tour to uh, to, to Morecambe with Lancaster City Council. So Mor Morecambe is more, definitely Morecambe, and I, I think you know I think I'm I'm from the northwest, and I lived a, a lot of years up up that way. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, Morecambe definitely um, would be one of the places. But uh, a, a lot of the uh, the towns along the the Cumbrian coast as well, I and mean, there's obviously the energy sector there that supports. Uh, um, Whitehaven, um, then you've got BAE Systems at Barrow. So they have got kind of the industrial uh, underpinnings to support uh, the towns. Mm -hmm. But there's there's others, there's Workington, there's Maryport, uh, there's Flimby that, yeah, probably all or are in search of a, a bit of a new identity and a new pull of people. Um, but they have the potential for those those raw ingredients as well, you know, surrounded by outstanding natural beauty, um, you know, pretty towns in, in their own right. So, yeah, those have, uh, those have been the ones that have been uh, pecking away in the back of my mind. Shout out to Flimby. Flimby. First mention of Flimby 
uh, on the podcast, um, <laughs> unsurprisingly. But yeah, absolutely, a, a fascinating initiative for people to to dive into, and, and another way of thinking about the, that town centre regeneration question that we're constantly talking about. Howard, thank you so much uh, for your time today. Thank you for scheming with me, uh, and thank you at home very much for listening. Please do join us next week for another episode of the Scheming Podcast. This episode of Scheming was sponsored by De Simone. De Simone Consulting Engineering provides structural engineering, facade design consulting, integrated design and detailing, and construction consulting services for buildings of all types. Known for delivering thoughtful, innovative, and sustainable solutions, De Simone provides dedicated services from its UK, US, Canada, South America, and Middle East offices. To find out more, visit www.d-simone.com.